My father was a really loving father, but he was vocal about his discomfort around gay people. Yeah. I had a conversation a couple of years after his death, my aunt. She said he knew and he was okay with it. I went to a, a therapist and I was dealing with, you know, fame and bereavement and my sexuality. And I was like, okay, I, it's time to deal with all of this stuff. So in my early 20s, I started to sort of properly come out. And it wasn't long before I was David, the only gay in the village. Hello, Matt Lucas. Hello. How are you? All right, thanks. How are you? Good. I don't even know when the last time was that I saw you face to face. I can't even think. But we have met. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember we once met around a pool in Miami? Oh, yeah. That was about 20 years ago. That would have been a while ago, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were both on holiday. You've got a good memory. <laughs> I've got a great memory. Yeah. For, for fun things, anyway. Yeah. But it's so lovely to see you. We've got lots to talk about, namely your beautiful book, The Boy Who Slept Through Christmas, which is a very entertaining book, but also a very poignant book and a book with music. Because you've got these little QR codes that you've put throughout the book, yeah, which then lead into songs that you've written. So why did you want to incorporate that element into your book? Well, so this is my first novel and it's for children, but also adults, I would say. Um... And it's my attempt to do a kind of home alone sort of um, big Christmas story. Um, I love musicals. I've been in a few musicals. And as I was writing the book, I thought I would love this to be a stage musical one day. And, you know, I was procrastinating from doing the next draft of the book by just writing some songs. And... Um, and it occurred to me that we have the technology now. You know, if I'd done this 15 years ago, there would have been a CD in the back that you would have lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I decided to do lyric videos and write and record 20 songs. And then as you read the book, the, there are QR codes throughout the book so you can hear the songs as you go through. So it is a musical novel. And if you get the ebook. As long as you're online, you click the links and it, it takes you through to the music videos. Or if you're listening to the audiobook, you just the songs just come on as and when. And um, I, yeah, I wanted to to a uh, try and convince somebody to invest in this to take it to the stage, and b. I thought, you know, not everyone lives near a theatre. Not everyone can afford to go to the theatre. This is a way of of bringing a musical to people. It's so lovely. And, mm. you know, obviously you've been in some fantastic musicals, but when did the sort of songwriting thing kick in? I, I hear that you got a piano during the pandemic to sort of tinkle around on. Was that where these songs started forming? Well, I had... I, when I, li I lived in America for seven years and I had uh, a nice piano there. Um, like a grand. A baby grand. A baby grand. Yeah, Very yeah. sexy. Yeah, but my house in London is much smaller. And I would, you, if there was a baby grand, there would be no room in the room. No for, bed, but there's a piano. Yeah, there would be no room to play it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I I started writing songs. Um, like I wrote a couple when I was at university, but I when I was on Shooting Stars, I started writing these little sort of forty five second comic songs. Um, and then at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I ordered that um, small electric piano to my house because I thought, hang on a minute, I might be here for a while. And um, and I started playing Thank You Baked Potato, which was one of my old songs. Um, and the reason I played it is because I think it's only got three or four chords in it. It was about the only thing I could play because I can't read music. And I'm not a pianist. I can just play chords and figure out chords to songs as I go. And I changed the lyrics and made it um, about the pandemic you know, because I thought this is quite an alarming time for children. And also a lot of adults weren't social distancing um, right at the beginning. And I thought, I remembered when I was a kid, uh, my dad was a smoker and I really wanted him to stop smoking. And there was this cartoon, a, a television commercial on TV with Superman and Nicotine was the villain. <laughs> and I kept seeing this advert and then I would lobby my father to give up smoking. Yeah. And so I thought if, if I can get the kids, I can get to the adults as well. So I just had that moment because I was so um, 
distressed at watching the news and seeing that people weren't social distancing because I just thought maybe we're all going to die. And um, so I just put it on my Twitter. I just filmed myself singing Thank You Baked Potato with some new lyrics and it went viral. And then I recorded it as a single and it went to number one on iTunes and number one in the download charts. And uh, then I was approached to turn it into a book and I would paid for like a music video and all the, the proceeds went to this uh, charity called Feed NHS, which I was one of the founders on. I mean, founders of, I mean, really, um, Helen McCrory and um, uh, uh, Damien Lewis did the work along with a guy called John Vincent. Uh, they did a lot of the work, but I was sort of there or thereabouts. And this book came out, Thank You Baked Potato, and it did well and it raised money. And then I thought, I'll do a follow-up book. And I did a follow-up book called Merry Christmas Baked Potato, which was out two or three years ago. And for that book, I wrote like a four-minute song. And when I wrote that song, I thought, ooh, I've just written a full song, not yeah. just a little minute-long jingle. I've written a full song here. Um, and that made me think, oh, maybe, maybe I should give this a go. Um, because I love musicals and I've been watching musicals my whole life obsessively and traveling all over the world to watch them. And I've pronounced on everyone's musicals, you know, what I liked, what I didn't like. So I thought it was time for me to put my money where my mouth is and start writing one myself. Well, it's a lovely addition to the book. And I is the short answer. Oh, we don't like short answers. It's we a like really long answer, we like sorry. really lovely loquacious answers. Yeah. No, it's it's a beautiful addition because you know you've got again the, this sort of entertainment of the story and it romps along and it's really really enjoyable. But you've got the the poignant element is. Leo, the main character in the book, has lost his mum and mm. he's anticipating Christmas Day without her and he's really wanting it to be the perfect Christmas Day. So you've got grief in there, which I think is really important around this time of year because, of course, Christmas is its like a full-bodied experience whether you want it or not. It's got colours that we recognise. It smells of pine needles and cinnamon and it's got jingle bells and sounds to it and everywhere you go at this time of the year you know twinkly lights it's sort of everywhere so I think if you have lost someone it's kind of unavoidable you're gonna be thinking about them or what your Christmas time was like when they were around so it is an incredibly difficult time for some people out there of course you've experienced a, a acute grief in your life in varying ways did it just feel like a very important thing to bring that to this book? It's a kid's book, but you've got to be able to cover grief and talk about these big subjects with the youth audience. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought, you know, there will be children out there and this Christmas might be, for a lot of them, their first Christmas without a grandparent or an uncle, an aunt, um, a teacher, a neighbour, a friend, maybe in terrible cases, a parent or a sibling or even a pet. Yeah. And and, um, you know, we we Christmas is really idealized uh, in the media. And for many people, Christmas is a very difficult time, but it is still a time to stop and give thanks for the year that's just gone. And, you know, think about how things might change for the better in the year ahead. And um, uh yeah, I mean, I've I lost my father when I was twenty two, and he died late November. So that Christmas was hard, as was the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Um, and it's strange because I'm Jewish, so we have Hanukkah, but we still get together on Christmas Day because it's a public holiday, and also because some members of our family are not Jewish. Um, people have married people who aren't Jewish. Um, or some members of our family were not born Jewish and converted. And so we celebrate Christmas without a Christmas tree, and we don't do Christmas presents, but we have Hanukkah presents, and Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of light, is around the same time as Christmas. So we often end up giving the presents on Christmas Day. Um, we don't have Christmas carols, but we, as a family, we like the turkey and the roast potatoes and <laughs> all of that. So we, we sort of... Our Christmas doesn't look that 
much unlike a lot of peoples in this country, you know. And we're British. It's we're, we're Jewish, but we're British, but and you, so we want to do a, a British Christmas. You go into a shop and there's Christmas music playing. I think yeah. it's unavoidable no matter where your religious beliefs sit, you know, whereabouts you are in the country. It is unavoidable. And Irving Berlin wrote White Christmas, and he was Jewish. There you go. You know, a lot of uh, 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 Christmas songs <laughs> have been written by uh, uh, Jews, so I thought, right, it's time to, to do a few myself. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Christmas is, is tough. I've had loss. I've, I've lost a, a partner. I've lost a parent, um, both very much before their time, two people gone before their time. And so, um, I'm aware of that anxiety and that pressure. Um, and it's not even not everyone, not everyone has lost someone, but some people are just, they might've lost their job or they might be, you know, struggling financially and uh, particularly at the moment. So, there's all sorts of things. They might not be well. They might be in hospital. Christmas is a challenge for a lot of people. This book is poignant, but it's also funny. I mean, it is a comic novel. And, uh, you know, this boy wishes Christmas away. And for reasons that are explained in the book, but which I'm not going to give away, he does sleep through Christmas and wakes up and it's Boxing Day and he's got to go and get Christmas back. And so the last sort of third of the book is his sort of road movie, his road trip going around trying to find Father Christmas and getting into various different scrapes and adventures. And um, so, yeah, the book is poignant, but there's also a lot of humour in it, a lot of silliness, a lot of fun, lots of characters. And um, I worked really hard on it, and it's not cool to say it, but I'm really proud of it. Well, you bloody well should be. I think it's a really lovely thing to say that. We're so weird about saying we're proud of stuff, aren't we? Especially as adults. I think we get really... Oh, I feel eggy about it, but yeah. there are things that I'm really proud of inside. I think it's a really lovely thing to admit out loud. Yeah, there's a few songs in it as well, I think. Oh, I didn't know that I could write like that. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really cool. And also to sort of discover that you're really wanting to push forward with that... I'm not, I'm not going to use the word hobby, but that new sort of career passion down the line. We don't have to discover all this as teenagers and kids. These can be things that develop as you yeah. get older. I Wrote love the first that. musical at 49. It's fantastic. And, and um, uh, you know, and the songs were written during a period where I was actually very depressed and I kind of locked myself away for a couple of months and wrote my way out of depression, which what, I'm, not saying, was... I'm not saying uh, that everyone can creatively yank themselves out of it. Um, by any means, but that's what I did, I was able to do on this occasion for myself. I, I mean, I, I've experienced the same without a doubt. Like, creativity has been my saviour again and again in yeah. whatever form, whether it's writing or painting or just brainstorming ideas. And I think, you know, everyone's got creativity within them. Sometimes it's just not recognised, I guess. What was bringing on that particular period of depression? Uh, I just had some bad news and I was renovating my house and I wasn't in my own house. And I know, I know, I, I, I don't mean it, not in a grand way. My house is really small, two bedroom house, little, little house that I live in, which I love, you know, it's, um, but it's my home, my little nest. And so that that probably didn't help as well. Just, I don't know. I mean, that, that was a side issue. I just had some, just had some things happen, you know, and they, you know, knocked me for six. And, um, but I think I probably, without that depression, I probably would have had six songs in this book or four. But I locked myself away and just, completely threw myself into this I mean I wasn't it you know it was quite feverish I, I was not really sleeping much I was it's very hard I found for me when I write songs um I find it hard to sleep until a song is finished but I also find it I don't know if a song is ever finished mm -hmm. so so I was living strange hours and just being completely instinctive um as a writer, which is not something I've found that easy to do in a world where your phone's on and there's social media and just we, I seem to know more people than I ever knew before. Yeah, what's and, that about? Uh, well, it's just it's just the way it's gone, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and to actually sort of hide for a couple of months uh, and also, you know, to shock my agent because uh, <laughs> after the Christmas break, um, 
you know, I emailed my agent and said, um, so there's now 20 songs in this. And, or I think there was maybe 18 or 17 at that point. And she was like, okay, well, in the book, there'll be four songs. And then it's great that you've written the rest for the musical. I went, no, in the book, there'll be 20 songs, I guess, because I couldn't divorce one from the other. The, mm. the two are the sa one and the same, the, 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 the book and the songs. It, it's one entity. Um, so we just had to deal with the practicalities of recording a musical, which I paid for the music and hired some of the greatest singers in the West End and, and did that. But it was, you know, then the publishers, sort of everyone retrospectively had to get on board and, yeah. and we had to work out technically how to do it. So I sort of threw this big curveball at the publisher and at my agents and, um, you know, fair play to them and, and much gratitude to them all for running with it. Yeah, I've worked really hard on this. Isn't wow. it interesting how sometimes the fluidity of creativity is much more fluent when we're not feeling good? Yeah. I often have that. If I'm feeling chipper... I'm sort of less inclined to maybe dig deeper and get a bit introspective or whatever might need to be excavated. I can sort of, I don't know, flit around the surface. But when you're not feeling good, that's where I'm painting better or I'm writing from maybe a deeper you have, place. you have to get it out. You do. You have to sort of purge yourself of yep. it somehow. And so, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't want this to sound conceited, um, but there are like, lyrics in this that I didn't know I had in me mm. and there are musical phrases in this I didn't know I had in me I didn't know it was so it has been a journey of discovery um you know I've written a lot of sketches with David Williams over the years and I've written lots of little comic songs on my own but to write you know the opening number is almost 14 minutes long in this it's a bit of an opus <laughs> I love it yeah it's um, a queen bohemian rhapsody yeah it's uh yeah as my mum says is it a bit too long <laughs> Is it a bit too long? <laughs> it's never long enough, quite it, frankly. It might be a bit too long. <laughs> I think it's a bit too long. But it's so brilliant. The other songs that are shorter, don't worry. Oh, it's so lovely. And the character Leo, he's very responsible and he wants to get things right. And obviously part of that is due to his grief. But at times in the book, he is quite lonely as well. Are they feelings that you experienced in childhood that you drew upon? I think childhood is lonely. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's so much you have to figure out for yourself. Um, so much that isn't explained, so much to process all the time. You know, my gosh, I'm so glad my childhood, we didn't have Instagram in my childhood oh, and Twitter. thank God. And YouTube. I mean, they're great when they're great, but I'm so glad I wasn't overwhelmed and bombarded. I mean, I have books, thick books that I grew up with that I read time and time and time again because there wasn't really much else to do and I remember when I was I think we were nine or ten and we got a we rented a video recorder from Granada or Rumbelow's radio <laughs> rentals one of those places and then things changed we had a bit of control you yeah. could record something and then put it on when you wanted to and that that changed I think about the generation before us who didn't even have video recorders oh, God. and two television channels. Oy. I try and tell my kids now, guys, you know you're choosing out of the 8,000 films that are available to you. We just had to watch what was on. Yeah. And their brains cannot accept that idea that hey, there was just four things you could choose from. I hated Why Don't You. Why Don't You? Yeah, I hated it because I couldn't <laughs> understand the accents of the people on it. If they were from Newcastle or Wales, I couldn't because I hadn't really met people from those places. Yeah, same. And I couldn't understand them. The accents were too thick for me as a kid, mm. but I never missed it. <laughs> and that's the point. We had no choice. We had no. We had nothing to do. <laughs> I mean, nothing. I mean, I think. Why don't you? Yeah. Such a good reference. I like people from Wales and Newcastle. Don't worry. Oh yeah, no, same. Yeah, yeah. but it was just I couldn't. I didn't know what they were saying. Or Northern Ireland. I just didn't. Uh, know what they were saying. But we didn't go anywhere. So no. we didn't we weren't mixing with people exactly. from other parts of the country because we were literally where we lived. Yeah. And it, that was it. Parochial. Yeah. I mean I've I've heard you talk about your childhood in, in varying ways, one of them relating to your alopecia mm. and saying that you had this keen sense of developing a personality 
probably prematurely because you were keen not to be the kid who just didn't have hair. You yeah. wanted to be known for other things. Do you think that's helped you cultivate your comedy, your humour as well as a, a young person? Yeah, I think the elements of that and also I had um, five years at a, a very um, hard secondary school that I found very a very difficult environment and and I think that and not having hair and yeah and other other things going on difficult things a, a parent my parents divorced my dad went to prison there were a few you know there were a few things I also had really bad asthma and really bad eczema as a kid and I was I you know for the first sort of 10 years of my life I think I was sort of covered in eczema my body um and I just saw acting as a way of of not being me and being someone and something else and and in terms of sort of developing a sense of humor and developing a, a sort of some kind of vocal dexterity in terms of you know a sharpness uh was just was 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 a necessity to counteract the things that people said to me you said you were either you sort of recognised you were either being bullied or patronised. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Mm. So what were you, so your coping mechanism was sharpness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Humour. Yeah. You know, my late father was a big fan of of comedy and American comedy, and was you know I was shown Blazing Saddles at a young age, and I and um, you know from my birthday I think when I was twelve or eleven taken to to see Spaceballs. So, you know, and my dad encouraged me to watch Jack Benny. And um, uh, I remember being 10 or 11 and uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus had just come out on video. And my dad rented those and The Meaning of Life and all those movies. And some of them were really rude. And the deal was, you know, you can watch, you can't watch horror movies or mm -hmm. gore. You can watch movies with bad language. But if you use the bad language, you can't watch those movies anymore. Mm. So that was the deal. So I was like, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so I had this great comic education from my father. Um, and and I used to watch Saturday Live on TV and Jasper Carrot and these shows. And I had this um, tape recorder that I would hold up to the television. And then in the school playground, I would be listening. I had this Sony Walkman ripoff. And one of the earphones didn't work, but one of them did. <laughs> and I would listen to these comic routines in the school playground, you know, at lunchtime. And then uh, when I was 18, I started doing stand-up comedy and I ended up performing alongside some of the comedians whose routines I'd learned, you know, five, six years earlier when I was quite starstruck. But, yeah, it was a necessity to me as a child with no hair from the age of six to it, to be good at something. Had I been a great footballer, a great sportsman, had I been a brilliant musician, I think it would have been okay. I needed to be really good at something had I been a good artist. But I wasn't great at any of those things. I was an all right drummer. I had a drum kit from the age of 13 for my bar mitzvah and I ended up playing on Shooting Stars. Of course. Yeah, so I mean, I could, I could play the drums, but I wasn't, I'm no buddy guy, you know. I'm not a, a was that the guy? Charlie, what's he called? Buddy Rich? Buddy. There was some brilliant drummer and I've shown myself up by not knowing his name. You know Charlie Watts? Yeah, Charlie Watts, yeah. I think it might be Buddy Rich. We'll go Buddy Rich because I don't know either. Yeah. Let's say, no, let's say someone new. Let's say <laughs> I'm no e Ivan Carmichael. <laughs> let's just say there was a drummer called that. Let's land on that. No, I'm no Ivan Carmichael. <laughs> um, his group, uh, Mervyn Bailey's Jazz Muffins, were... <laughs> really big influence on me. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> um, no, I get it. And, I, you know, I think for, for a lot of kids that feel like they perhaps don't fit in, there is an urgency to cultivate something that makes them stand out for other reasons. And it's um, it can lead you to really great things. Really great things. Yeah. Or bad things. Or bad things. You've got to pick a passion that's, you know, beneficial yeah. and not detrimental to your well-being and life. Um, you mentioned there that your dad went to prison. This was when you were a young teenager and it was a brief spell. And I've heard you again say that it's something that you just kind of got through at the time. Yeah, is, we got through it. Is that something that you've had to sort of process as an adult? Uh, thinking about that, I mean, this book, you know, there will be children whose parents will be in prison this Christmas. Yeah. You know, or siblings. Um, yeah. We don't 
think a lot about the prison population. Um, my dad uh, made some mistakes in his business and, you know, paid the price. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, it was not, it's not nice going to visit someone in prison. That's for sure. It's not, it's not, it's really stressful for, as a kid. Um, and, um, have you ever been inside a prison in this country? I don't think I have. I'm trying to think if I've ever done any filming in one. I'm very nervous around the subject of prisons. I don't, I can't put my finger on why. I mean, there are maybe certain reasons, but yeah, I feel nervous about prisons, going in prisons. I'm massive, massive admiration for people that do work in prisons and much needed work on mental health and, you know, general sort of care and well-being and, and helping people in prison. I find it quite a tough subject, I think. People are there for so many different reasons. Yeah. So when you're in there, you are, you know, m my dad was um, convicted of fraud and was sentenced to nine months. And in those days, you got a third off for good behavior, as long as your sentence was under a certain, uh, it was a, you know, I don't think if you were sentenced to 30 years, you get necessarily get a third off for good behavior for a really severe crime. But my dad was sentenced to nine months and served six. I think nowadays, if he was sentenced to nine months, he would serve fewer than six months, because I think it's half your sentence. But he was in prison with murderers mm. and, uh, rapists and heroin, uh, you know, dr drug sellers and all that kind of thing. And um, it's not massively streamlined. There's there's like open prison and closed prison. Um, and he was moved to a, a, a an open prison after, I think, 10 days. But the first 10 days of his sentence, he spent in a closed prison, um, sharing a cell with a, you know, a, a, with someone. And I think uh, that's that's pretty scary for people, you know. And maybe, uh, and I know a lot of people think it should be scary, you know. Um, that there's different aspects, isn't it? One reason you go to prison is to protect the public. Another reason you go to prison is for punishment. Another reason you go to prison is for rehabilitation. There's all it's it's you know there's lots of different um, reasons, but um, I feel like. Um, I feel I feel sorry for the population of people in prison. You know, a lot of them haven't had the opportunities um, that others have had, and um, yeah, I think it's a it's a very tough environment. Yeah, I wish for those people it wasn't as tough as it is. When he came out, did you notice that it had changed him in yeah, ways? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course it had changed him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he swore like a trooper when he came out. It's <laughs> a great new skill. Yeah. He swore like a trooper, um, yeah, and then that dissipated, mm. and then he, you know, yeah, it's different. He was he didn't sweat the small stuff anymore when he came out. You didn't get the opportunity to talk about your sexuality with your dad, which I know has left you with a certain amount of regret that you didn't get to have that conversation. Well, with him. you know, it was a generational thing. So my father was a really loving father, um, really supportive very kind to me, um, would come and see my comedy gigs, was really proud of me, made sure to tell me. Um, there was so much about him that was good. Um, you know, even though he'd made this mistake earlier, you know, uh, in, uh, and, and paid for it. Um, he was very loved there were over 400 people at his funeral he died very young he dropped down dead of a heart attack at 52 and um i look up to him very much i think he was from a generation that didn't understand um uh, uh, lgbtq plus um people uh you know back then uh, visibility was much smaller. Uh, being gay was linked so strongly to AIDS. Um, a lot of people saw homosexuality as a sort of deviant behaviour rather than 
a sort of identity. And so um, there was that. I also was single. I wasn't really dating anybody back then. So it wasn't like there was ever a time where I wanted to sit him down and say, hey, look, I met someone. Um, but he was vocal about his um, discomfort around gay people. Yeah, very vocal about that. Um, but he did say something to me uh, not long before he died. He didn't know he was going to die. None of us knew. He did flippantly, he not. He did sort of throw something into a conversation once. He said, oh, if you ever want to come over, if you want to bring a friend over or, or a girl or a guy or whatever, like just, just, you know, that's fine, let me know. And he threw that in and I was like, did he just say that? Well, he died and I hadn't come out to him. And I had a conversation a couple of years after his death, two or three years after his death with his sister. And I told her on the phone that I was gay, my aunt, um, who recently passed away. And, and she said, your father knew. I said, did he? She said, yeah, he knew. He was just waiting for you to tell him. And then, so I thought, okay, he, she said he knew and he was okay with it. Mm. He was okay with it. He'd come to terms with it. So I didn't tell him I was gay because, well, like I say, I wasn't seeing anybody. I wasn't going on dates. But also I thought it would break his heart. And also I was a little bit worried that he might not want to see me anymore. So I just thought, you know what? At the time, I felt like it would have been a selfish thing to do to tell him I was gay because I, um, I, I thought maybe, you know, it'll cause a lot of drama and it's not about me, you know. I get enough attention because people are always talking about me because I'm on the telly and that's probably, I should just leave it, you know, I just leave it. And also, I don't think I was very confident in myself, you know. I, I, having grown up without hair and obviously being overweight, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have any great sense that there were people queuing up to date me. So I just sort of, even though I was sort of, told, my friends knew like that I was, you know, gay or, or maybe I like women as well. I wasn't sure I was figuring it out. Um, there was no urgency in coming out in that regard. But after he died and after my grandmother died, I went to a, a therapist and I was dealing with, you know, fame and bereavement and my sexuality. And I was like, OK, I, it's time to deal with all of this stuff. So in my early 20s, I started to sort of properly come out. And in my mid 20s, I came out to my mum and my stepdad and my brother and just everyone else, you know. Um, and it wasn't long before I was David, the only gay in the village. <laughs> In PVC and leather. That's my favourite. Yeah, so so you know, I I I, I did the whole journey. Um, but so yeah. many people of our generation will have had that experience, and actually, we we can't ignore the people out there who still feel terrified to come out because it could be of religious re yeah, reasons yeah. or whatever. And I was brought up religious. today. Yeah, it's yeah. that's terrifying. Yeah, when it's... I when I told my mum I was gay. Um, I mean, this is 25 years ago. You know, one of her first instincts was, well, the rabbi doesn't approve, you know. Well, now at our synagogue, the rabbis are okay with it and they do, you know, lesbian and gay blessings there and things like that. So people do evolve and, and communities evolve. And I've no doubt, I've no doubt my dad would have been fine with it. Like, I've no doubt, you know. Um, it just takes time and it, it also... Also, you know, it's an abstract thing. But when people meet the partner or they just see, meet the friends and they go, ah, oh, it's fine, you know. And almost all of my friends growing up were straight. And none of, they're all still my friends. None of them have any remotest issue with me being gay or anything. It's, it's really not that, it's not that interesting. No, but I think that it, it's, it's a really important conversation to have because there are still people that aren't able to live in a liberated way as oh, they yeah. should be able to. And also I think, you know, we grew up in a particularly homophobic and just strange time during the sort of 80s and 90s. It's It wasn't like it is today where we're having really open chats and there are m moments to mark the celebration around mm. it. It was, you know, a very fearful time for people wanting to come out. This is how it was. You'd, you'd watch 
TV and, you know, once every couple of months there'd be... Kilroy was this was this programme that was on in the mornings on the BBC and it was... He'd be walking around the audience. It was a bit like a sort of Oprah, mm -hmm. Winfrey-type show. And, um, and every couple of months there'd be a sort of fairly incendiary, um, often quite lurid sort of gay-related episode like, you know, these gays want to get married or these gay people want to adopt or these gay people think that, you know, it should be allowed to, to teach about homosexuality and sex education in schools or, or whatever it was. And the majority, the vast majority of the studio audience would be against homosexuality by default. And uh, you'd have a few people who would be out on the show talking and they would sort of treat it a bit like freaks. And I would talk to people and I would sort of sound them out on, on the subject, you know, when I was meeting new people. And somebody would say, a very common response was, I don't care what they do in private, just as long as they don't shove it down my throat. And that was seen as a liberal, yeah. open-minded take. If you met someone and they said that, you thought, oh, yeah, OK, they don't hate me. Um, and, that, and that's amazing. But there was so much fear about AIDS mm. as well. And, and you have to understand that uh, in the 80s and 90s when you, when you look at what it was to be gay in this country, you, you have to understand that. You also have to understand Section 28, which banned the promotion of homosexuality in schools, which came in when I was about 14 or 15, um, where, whereby you could not mention the existence of homosexuality as a teacher for fear of being sacked and prosecuted, I think. Certainly being sacked. I mean, it's yeah. it's not long ago. Is the other terrifying thing? No, it's not thing. long ago, and actually, it's it was not repealed long ago. Repealed not that long ago. Things like gay marriage weren't even a concept. People weren't really no. talking about gay marriage. No, weren't really. There's an episode of uh, I think this morning, um, probably in the Richard and Judy era, where there's a gay wedding on the show, and it is just seen as the biggest freak show in the world. You know, I mean, they're celebrating it. Um, but it's just seen as the most bizarre thing, two men getting married. I mean, and this is something that you, yeah, you're internalising. I'm not sure, I'm, well, I'm pretty sure there weren't many people that you could talk to about those feelings or the fear that you must have had growing up as a teenager. No, not really. But when I was 16, I met David Williams, who was, um, who had a girlfriend, but would, we'd go out, I'd meet him, we'd go to the theatre. I was 16, he was 19. Oh no, I, actually, when I, we met, then but the next year we were in a show together at the National Youth Theatre and then we started socialising so I would have been 17 he would have been 20 and he had this beautiful girlfriend Katie but we'd go to the theatre and then I'd meet him at the station and he'd be wearing a skirt and um, tall uh, and, and long black socks and like a uh, uh, hair clip and lipstick and makeup and I'd go oh my god <laughs> and people would stare at us on the tube and so we, he he kind of pushed me propelled me in a way to be a bit more out there and a bit more which obviously we were in our comedy um he had a fearlessness about him we had a girlfriend but he he, he there was a queerness to him and um and so he, he, he moved everything so far uh, that I had to move a bit with him and, and become less apologetic um, about who I was. So, I mean, I really put that down to him. And, and I remember calling him and I'd known him for years and years and years. And, and I came out to my uh, mum, I think, 98, 99. And I called David up and I said, even though we would see each other Monday to Friday every day, but I think it was a Friday night. And I called him up and I said, you know, I might be a little bit fragile, a little bit tender on Monday because I, I've just had this big conversation with my mum and told him, told her that I'm gay. And he was really great about it and said, well, that's brilliant that you did that. And you know how wonderful and you'll be able to be the person you are and you'll be able to go dating. And he was really supportive and loving. And, you know, we ended the call and there's a beat and then the phone rang and I picked it up and it's David goes, you never told me you were gay. <laughs> Ugh, disgusting. And then just hang up. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, which is exactly. And which it's David perfect. was like, David just saw it as kind of fun and funny and silly <laughs> and daft. And 
an opportunity for humour, which, you know, obviously we did in our in Little Britain, you know, uh, uh, dressing up as everything. And so um, it was really healthy for me to have someone like that in my life offering a totally different view because he'd also grown up in the suburbs but he, you know, he was quite a rebel himself. Mm, I love when you meet people that bring out your own inner fearlessness because we've all got it. Yeah. It just depends on the environment you've been brought up in, what you've got going on. But when you meet those people who drag you out of your comfort zone and take you to sort of the the boundaries you're not even sure are there, that is exciting. And I think it's it's brilliant because you've got people like that who who pull out that fearlessness. And in the same way, and you can be influenced in a really positive way, but I think on the other end of it, when you look back to the 80s and 90s, where you've got people who are openly being homophobic, it's because they're just simply going with crowd mentality. And there's so much to be said for that in in a negative way and a positive way that people just go, oh, everyone else is thinking this, so I'll just go with that. You see it now even on social media, people jumping on negative bandwagons just to sort of be part of the crowd. And it's Mm. actually so liberating when people take you in a whole other direction. Yeah, and so Little Britain was a very queer show and we played, you know, transvestites and gays and, you know, we were keen to shock and celebrate and challenge people and how comfortable were they with this. And, you know, now it's viewed from quite a different perspective, but at the time we were doing it, it was quite a sort of uh, sort of lefty liberal way of challenging the status quo by being unapologetically, shamelessly queer on primetime BBC, you know. And, and yeah, there you go. It was game-changing. I mean, in some ways, maybe. I don't mm. know. And you have hinted at writing together? Yeah, we've got an idea. We've got a couple of ideas for things. So we, we're meeting and we're talking. And, um, you know, he writes three or four books a year. I'm now it's got, wild. I'm writing another book. Um, I co-host Fantasy Football League. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're busy boys. So it's just it's just it's finding the time. But yeah. we had lunch last week. That was really nice. And we do we message each other pretty much every day. Um, just sharing memes and um, <laughs> jokes and shocking stories we've seen like all friends do. You know, yeah. we do that. And um and we laugh a lot, which is mm. nice. You know, One totally unrelated um, thing that I read about you, which I thought was so lovely, was this really gorgeous relationship you had with your grandmother mm. and the fact that you would speak on the phone really regularly. And that's something that you massively miss now. And it really got me thinking about my own grandparents. You know, certainly my grandmothers I had a really great relationship with. And I really miss... I, I, I actually look back and think, why didn't I ask them x y and z why didn't i have the conversation about you know my nan being evacuated in the war or whatever it might be and the importance of that and sort of you know trying to drill it into my own kids not that they're particularly interested in that but it is such a lovely relationship to have and the fact that you would speak on the phone almost nightly what Mm. did those conversations bring you what did you talk about um well my grandmother uh was a refugee from nazi germany and she her plan was to be a doctor like her father, who was a very eminent doctor. Um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, the Nazis banned um, Jews from going to school in the end. So so uh, her, inter- her education was interrupted and she, you know, she made it to the UK. And, uh, you know, I'm always incredibly grateful that Britain took her in, you know. Um, and... Uh, she became a nurse and she was a really fiercely intellectual person and so our conversations were about art and theatre and politics and current affairs um, very much you know she challenged me a lot Um, I didn't agree with her politics necessarily Um, in fact I didn't agree with her politics Uh, but uh, we would have sort of deep intellectual conversations and um, it was great, you know, and she had a very, she could be stubborn and I mean, hugely affectionate and loving. Um, and you know, she had one child, uh, my mum and two grandchildren. So, you know, we meant everything to her. Um, but she was a great sort of matriarch of the family as well in terms of, 
um, uh, cousins and people like that. And, um, you know, she'd lost her parents. She'd lost a lot of cousins in the war, aunts and uncles in the Holocaust. So she was acutely aware of, you know, the value of, uh, of, of staying close to those who have survived. Um, she was great. She was funny. Um, she even came to see me do stand up, which is wild because I was doing really strange performance, <laughs> I like, performance art like stand up using the C word, using really, really extreme language. Um, and she would come and watch it sometimes. I love yeah. that. Yeah. And she saw me at the Hammersmith Apollo when Shooting Stars was on a double bill with the Fast Show. And um, she would come to radio shows. I think she wanted me to be a Shakespearean actor. I think that was what she wanted for me, which I did end up doing a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted me to be in the RSC or the National yeah. Theatre, you know. Um, I mean, gloriously, she was a snob. <laughs> I love a glorious snob. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she was German, but she was also sort of fiercely proud of being British. She very much took to British life and she loved the royals. And so she would take us, me and my brother, when we were kids, to things like the Royal Tournament and the British Museum, the Imperial War Museum, um, the Museum of London, uh, all of these kind of places to theatres. And um, she was a huge fan of opera. So she would play us opera sometimes, which I found very boring. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was a big, she was a big influence on me. Her and my mum and my dad, all in different ways, were huge influences on me. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. It's really lovely. She was like a very, very special person. Matt, it's been so lovely talking to you. Nice talking really to you. Really enjoyed chatting to you, and I love your book. I wish you all the luck with it. Is it? Are you turning it into a musical? Is it happening? Well, I mean, it is a musical already because it's a musical novel. But on um, the stage, yeah, I've had yeah. I've had some interest from producers. So, um, yeah, we're gonna set up some meetings, I guess, and explore the possibility of getting it on stage. Um, there's a gig happening. I think it's on the third of December, second or third of December. It's the Sunday at the Cadogan Hall, uh, a big Christmas show where we're performing two of the songs from the musical with an orchestra. So I'm very excited about that. I'm going to be singing myself. It's a lovely venue as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's the Chorus Christmas Show. Um, so that'll be a chance to hear them live uh, and for me as well. And um, I had an amazing afternoon about two weeks ago where I went to the home of Claude Michel Schoenberg, who's the composer of Les Miserables. And um, I played him some of the music and he gave me lots of advice and criticism and guidance. And that was really wow. invaluable and I felt incredibly honoured to be in that in his presence with him listening to my work given that he's written possibly the greatest musical ever written or, or it's certainly up there and um, yes yeah, so that was great so I'm really really keen to to get it onto the stage and to write new songs and maybe cut some and to to change it and explore what else it can be yeah well, I wish you all the love and luck with all of it. Thank you. And thank you so much for being on Happy Place. It was very nice to get out of the house. And also, I love your jumper. I like yours. We're, you. We've got really good knitwear going on today. We have. Yeah. We have. We've got, we've got Christmas on our minds. We really have. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.